Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Edwin Rutsch, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'm here today with uh, Terry Givens. Uh, welcome to our uh, chance to dialogue about empathy. Thanks so much for having me. So I want to start with a little intro, um, just I got from your, your website, and it's uh, your CEO and founder of Brighter Higher Ed, and you're a political scientist who has 30 years of uh, experience in higher education, politics, international affairs, and nonprofits. And you have a website, uh, terrygivens.com. Anyone can go and check that out. And you're author of, yay, yay. Radical Empathy, uh, Finding a Path to Bridging uh, Racial Divides, which is what That's we right. wanted to talk about. So in terms of uh, introduction, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that's a pretty good introduction. Um, and I would just add that I'm, I'm here in, in sunny Menlo Park, right next to Stanford University, my alma mater, and um, also did my PhD at UCLA. So I'm a, a Pac-12 kind of person. Okay, I'm here in uh, El Cerrito near UC Berkeley. So. Mm -hmm. And I, I promise not to hiss. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a, there's that antagonism between the two schools. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah, so great. So I've looked at some of your interviews that you've done already. And, you know, part of your book, a large part of it is this sort of memoir about your, you know, growing up in Spokane, going to Stanford, your path through the uh, education system hierarchy, working your way up the, the hierarchy. And so you've already talked about that quite extensively in these other interviews, and there'll be links to those, uh, you know, down down below. Mm -hmm. So what I thought we could talk about is the you know the subtitle of your book, and you know, kind of posing the question: How might we bridge the the racial divides with empathy? And maybe you know, just ch talk about that and have a bit of a, a a dialogue about ideas and strategies and mm -hmm. you know steps forward. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I believe it all starts with empathy because, you know, one of the things I looked at is why haven't we made progress? We haven't bridged our racial divides to the extent that you would think we would have by now. Um, we've had years and years of, you know, diversity training and civil rights movement. And, you know, and last, it's funny because I wrote my book before last summer. And so I was actually more influenced by what happened in 2016 with the police murders and, and you know, some police themselves getting attacked and, and so on. I rem remember very clearly that summer of 2016 just being, you know, really horrific. And, you know, it, it, I had already been thinking about writing something and I was like, well, what can we do? And I went through some um, you know, practices with uh, some organizations that really try to, you know, start with the self and to help us develop empathy. And as I thought through, I was like, well, wait a second, you know, it's great that I, you know, I can do these things to understand, you know, there's the different um, exercises you can do to, you know, like you start all start in a line and it's, you say, oh, if I've ex you've experienced, you know, uh, homelessness, you know, take a step back. And, you know, if you, you lived in a neighborhood that was you know, all white, you know, take a step forward, things like that. So it's the, the, that exercise that shows you kind of how structures impact us. Mm -hmm. but, um, so that's great for building empathy, but it's it. What about taking action? What are you supposed to do after you get that empathy? Because it's funny. I went through this um, with my son, and when he started high school, they have this program that's supposed to basically help the kids gain empathy and then you know to avoid bullying. But I was like, well, it tells them you know they should feel feel something for their their classmates, but where's the action? And so that's things like that are, are what really mm -hmm. got me thinking about how can we actually bridge these divides? What are the actions we can take? And like I said, it, it starts with the self, but really it means, um, you know, first of all, understanding the context of, of where you are. So I, I, you know, my neighbors who all have their Black Lives Matter signs, I'm sorry if you walk around El Cerrito and you'll see Definitely, the Black Lives yeah. Matter signs, mm -hmm. but what are you doing? To, to make Black Lives Matter. Besides, I mean, marching in the street is, is a very, very good action to take, but how is that creating change? That's why, you know, I talk about the six steps of radical empathy and the, mm -hmm. the last two are, are, are taking well, Before action. we start, maybe I can oh, just yeah. reflect back what I'm hearing. So what I'm hearing is, is uh, that you've seen some of these exercises, you know, for how do you build empathy? And you're really wondering like, what are the steps that you can take for, mm -hmm. you know, creating more 
uh, empathy and you see the importance of empathy uh, for sort of bridging divides and that uh, you're really looking at sort of the actions that people can take. Now you can put up signs or whatever and maybe you're seeing there's more that people that people can do to sort of bridge those divides. Indeed, and you're modeling that behavior by, you know, you're, you're showing me that you're listening by re reflecting back, you know, so it, when it, in terms of conversation and listening, you know, it, that's a really good example of one thing you can do, which is to show somebody you're listening and reflecting back what they're saying to you. Um, so I really appreciate that. And, um, but, you know, taking action means actually understanding what the issues are and then trying to change them. Right. That's so to me, it's not just empathy for another person. Right. It's also one important component of the book is explaining what are the structure, what is structural racism? What are what are the things we need to tear down? And I firmly believe it's it's we have to understand the issues in order to tear them, tear down the structures. So if you don't understand the reason why your neighborhood is all white, even though everybody's got a Black Lives Matter sign, how can you create change? Um, how can you? We, we hear all the time that people tend to vote against, so housing is a perfect example. You know, there's the NIMBY crowd that says, well, you know, I don't want these this low income housing in, in my backyard. It's like, well, do you understand why we need that low income? It's not just because we want poor people to move into this neighborhood, it's because for years and years and years and years, certain people have not had access to housing, to reasonably priced housing. And if we don't create it, we're going to continue these social inequities. And you know, you have to understand the perspective of these people who, who need that housing. They're just as intelligent, they're just as worthy as any of us who can afford it. Mm -hmm. So why what I'm wouldn't- What I'm hearing there is that it's really the, to understand how these uh, structures maybe support uh, racism or, or a manifestation of it. And through this understanding that you can then find ways of uh, sort of remedying those? Yes, uh -huh. okay. absolutely. Yes, 100%. Because, you know, like, so when my neighbors ask me, you know, what can I do? I say, well, you can support, uh, you know, bringing more affordable housing into our area and stop saying, I don't want this in my neighborhood, you know, um, and, and try to understand the perspective. Of, so you have empathy for these people who have worked hard all their lives and, and you want to have the same benefits that you have, who want to have good schools, you know, who want to have, you know, so, I mean, and I guess I'm trying to, to demonstrate, you know, that that you know willingness to to be vulnerable and understand my own biases so that other people can understand that we all have to understand our biases you know i mean i if you had asked me 20 years ago i would have said sure you know anybody can can you know not that anybody can live anywhere they want i certainly understand racism but um that were that we were changing and that um you know it was getting better but i i see now and we've all started to see what particularly with what happened with George Floyd and the ongoing murders of, of and, and it's not, you know, again, it's not just, you know, low income people, it's not just black people, you know, we're seeing the attacks on Asian Americans now. I mean, all of these things are happening and we have to really understand what some of these structural factors are that are, that are, that are causing okay. these things mm -hmm. to happen. So it's really understand, like, you see these, uh, this lack of empathy in a sense, right? When, mm -hmm. when there's a, uh, when somebody's harming somebody else or beating somebody else or demeaning them, that that's essentially a, a lack of empathy. So where does maybe we could frame it in the sense of where does this lack of empathy come from? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's causing this lack of empathy and what can we do to sort of remedy that and create more, more empathy between people? Yeah, and I think it it goes more broader to to us understanding other cultures um, and to understanding other communities. I mean, here in the, the Bay Area, especially where I live, you know, there's this big divide between East Palo Alto and then Palo Alto and Menlo Park and so on. And, you know, and you know, what if people from Palo Alto and Menlo Park? You know, there's I I see a lot of compassion, and the reason I I have a problem with compassion is it tends to be oh I feel badly for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not I'm there. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're you're dealing with, right? And I want to change it. <laughs> um, and so for too long there's been this divide that says oh well East Palo Alto they just have their problems. It's not my problem. No, it's all right. our problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I'm there with you with the compassion. That's been one of my concerns about uh, compassion is it can be so I feel sorry for you. Mm -hmm. And then you're you're trying to resolve problems out of your own feelings of feeling sorry for someone. So you're actually kind of 
trying to solve your own personal problem versus being in a in a dialogue so with with others so i'm hearing a little bit that maybe one of the steps would be having like dialogues with the mm -hmm. different communities right it's mm -hmm. like go to you know east palo alto and west i don't know if it's west palo alto but bring the communities together mm -hmm. to be in, in dialogue with each other Absolutely. And that, some of that work has been happening um, to a certain extent, but the problem is that, you know, we get busy in our day to day lives and, and you know, there's people like me who are out there you know, constantly working with the community organizations and making the connections and a lot of us just kind of sit over here, you know, in, on the west side of town, you know, in our little worlds and, and um, you know, we might donate some money to an organization that's helping low income kids, but we aren't really taking that next step of trying to really understand what the issues are. And, and you know, a part of this is, um, you know, I want to make sure we talk about history because, you know, if we don't understand our history, then it's really hard to understand how these structures came into play. Um, and so there was a really great program done recently uh, about around the book, The Color of Law. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with it. it oh, you are. No. Oh, well, I have to tell you about The Color okay. of Law because <laughs> it's this really great, it's a, you know, this uh, lawyer did research into, and I'm going to forget his name, I apologize, but um, uh, into uh, segregation and why uh, and redlining. So uh, for those who don't know, redlining is where banks basically would draw red lines around neighborhoods and said, we can't make loans to people in these neighborhoods or we won't give loans for houses you know, in these neighborhoods. And so it created these areas. That's why you see this huge difference between you know, East Palo, you know, why did couldn't Black people in East Palo Alto live in Palo Alto or, or Menlo Park? Well, because the banks wouldn't give them loans, real estate agents wouldn't take them to look at houses, you know, I mean, and so they, they created all these rules and regulations too, that it kept people from being able to, to purchase homes. And, you know, they, they actually designated certain areas and, and, you know, resisted building lower income, low, low you know, lower cost housing, but even things like the GI bill um, and, you know, the uh, loans for veterans were utilized in a very racialized way. So um, in any case, we did a, 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 some people did a presentation around it recently and talked about you know, specific neighborhoods and how they'd been impacted uh, by these different rules and how black people were kept out in various ways. Um, but it's how basically legal uh, boundaries were set up. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, showing sort of the history, the impact of what this, how the situation is as it is now. There's a history to how we sort of got here and sort of looking at understanding that, uh, that history. Uh, one thing, you know, since we're talking about like racism or to, I, I've been, for me, it seems that racism is a form of judgment. So what we're mm -hmm. really talking about is how we judge people. So the, it's sort of a higher level. We're, we're looking at people judge each other it's kind of we're swimming in a sea of judgment it seems well i call me. it I mean, the sea actually i call it the sea of white supremacy in my book <laughs> yeah, but there's other <laughs> kinds yeah there's a sea of white supremacy of judgment and then yeah. there's also judgments of gender age yes. ideas class yes. i mean you're you what graduated from stanford right there's a hierarchy of universities like yeah they stanford at, then berkeley <laughs> yeah <laughs> the other way around <laughs> Right, Yale, you know, Harvard, yeah. you know, they sit at yeah. the top. So there's a there's this hierarchy of you know condescension down the mm -hmm. and judgment, like, oh, I'm not gonna hire this person, this person from Harvard, I'm gonna Absolutely. hire them. So there's total judgment uh, around that. And then your class too, like, oh, you got more money, so you're judged there. So there's a history of judgments. I mean, all these his history of judgments is brought and all I mean, there's like even your politics, you know, if you're liberal, you're not gonna you're be judging the the, the conservatives, the conservatives judging. So it does seem, and then the core for me is that judgment is one of the biggest blocks to empathy. When we That's judge right. each other and we're not listening to each other, that it's it's blocking empathy. And so I think we're it's really fitting within a larger context of how do we get past our judgments mm -hmm. and really how do we build more empathy and have people hear and listen to each other. Yeah, and one of the ways I describe that is, you know, by my own personal experience. So, you know, now people know I'm, I'm, you know, because I've become famous, whatever, you know. But um, 
But, you know, when I was growing up and even in my 20s, you know, people would constantly try to put me in boxes. And, I, and it wasn't just white people, it was, it, you know, other black people would try to put me in boxes, too. And, you know, I call it my years of cognitive. So it's not only that we're judging others, it's that we have, I, that's why I talk about internalized depression, because we internalize what people say about us and what the way we think we should be acting, you know, I should talk this way and not that way. And, or, I, you know, it, you, you, when you're the smart kid, it's like, well, you know, how, how did you get to be so smart? And frankly, I think the way we deal with that is really silly because everybody has the potential to be quote unquote smart. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, growth mindset and all of that, but that's a side note. Um, but, you know, the way we judge people, yeah, absolutely is very limiting. And, um, you know, I had to work past that myself because I was judging myself based on what other people thought I should be. <laughs> mm, yeah, so what I'm hearing there is we have external judgments, people judging us, judging us at home, judging us at schools, judging us in societies. And then we internalize that and we start having our own internal self judgments. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you have your own personal experience, which you write about in the book, how you did have those own, your own uh, judgments. Mm -hmm. And so like, what do we do about, how do we address those judgments? Like, okay, we're in this state, we're live, we're swimming in, in these judgments, in this culture of judgment in a sense. And right. I think we need a culture of empathy, right? Yes. It's like we need to switch from a culture of judgment to a culture of empathy. It's like, how do we do that? You know? Yes, 100%. But I, I think the way we do that is, is, you know, for one thing, I think we should be teaching empathy in the schools. Um, but you have to teach the teachers first to have mm -hmm. empathy. Um, and so, yeah, I think empathy is, is, and you know, you know this, I mean, empathy can be taught, right? Um, and obviously there's certain people who may have, you know, certain psychological issues that make it difficult for them. But um, I think it's, you know, including my own mother, because I talk about that, but, um, you know, empathy is something that can be taught. And I do think it's really critical that we get to kids and, and try to help them, you know, develop empathy through the years so that, you know, we don't see the kinds of actions we see today, um, you know, where, where, you know, kids are so hard on each other. And Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah. Stanford, too. Like, I, I did, I have a practice, I, I, which I find that one of the best sort of gateway practices uh, for empathy building called the Empathy Circle. And it's built, it's based on the work of Carl Rogers, who the, my, at least my definition of empathy is built on his, you know, work with doing empathic listening mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, groups and therapeutic world. And so we, we, we I did, I was at Stanford and did some empathy circles with uh, high school students who are taking Stanford courses. And they're out there ribbing each other, putting each other down. I mean, it is a brutal, it is brutal what I saw with those, you know, students in terms of, you know, it, it, yeah, quite amazing. Yeah, I, I have to say I was lucky. I had both in undergrad and graduate school, I had a very supportive circle of friends because you can imagine being a first generation student, you know, just it was hard making that transition. Um, but I was lucky to have a good circle of people around me. Yeah, so I, I mean, um, what, what are you finding as the practices that are like good practices? Because I find what, so um, what we do is what we call the, like I mentioned, the empathy circle. So that's mutual active listening. Like in the, you know, Rogers, Rogerian empathic mm -hmm. listening was more of a, in the, in the uh, counseling, you know, therapeutic realm, you have the yeah. therapist would do the listening and it's kind of gone into conflict mediation and what we're trying to do is like we bring small groups together and then we have uh, like one person speaks and the, they speak to someone who listens back and reflects back mm -hmm. until you feel heard as a speaker. And then we have turn taking. And then once your turn is up, then the other, the listener becomes the speaker and they speak to someone and we go around the circle for like an hour, you know, or, or a couple mm -hmm. hours actually. And um, so I don't know, do you have practices like that that you've yeah. been doing or? Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things we do is, um, you know, for example, there's this video I like to show that uh, from, from, I think it's a Dutch uh, television that, sh you know, shows people, um, you know, 
so you have this very diverse group of people and, and they say, you know, okay, all the people who, you know, um, watched a football game or like you know, football, i.e. soccer, you know, come forward. And then, and then they, you know, it's again, one of these exercises, but mm -hmm. the thing I like about it is that it gets people to think about themselves from intersectional terms. Cause you, you mentioned this earlier, people have different identities and, um, so it gets people to think outside their current identity and identify with somebody, you know, maybe you like a certain TV show or, you know, maybe, um, you know, you, you grew up in, in a household with only one parent, but, you know, to get people to, or you're a step parent, you know, different things and where you can, and I'll send you the link to, to that video mm -hmm. so you okay. can share. I've it seen with some of listeners. those. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 But this is a good one because people say, well, it's, it's mostly white people. It's not really. It's a diverse group. But the reason I like it is because then, you know, if you are a white person, for example, you can see this and say, oh, well, there's these all these different types of intersectionality that connect me with people. So I think one of the things I try to do is get people to identify that you know there are different ways to connect with people so it's, it's I, I i love the this kind of stuff you guys are doing the active listening and and you know developing empathy that way but another way to to develop empathy is to kind of break out of your stereotypes of the way you, so when you see me you see a black woman and mm -hmm. you know you, you have all kinds of things that you connect with that but maybe you didn't know that i love superhero movies and maybe you didn't know that that I'm, you know, a huge star science fiction fan, you know, and there, so maybe we can so figuring out ways to connect with people that can then help you see them as a human being and somebody who you can talk to in a way that you, you might not have thought previous previously because you just see this barrier and that's yeah. and it comes back to the you know we were talking about at the beginning finding a path to bridging racial divides means seeing each other as human beings. And, and that we can connect in different ways. And so to me, it's that identifying. So, you know, I, I think it's really critical to have the, the listening and, and the, you know, being able to tell your story too is important. But it's also important to see somebody as a whole person mm -hmm. who is not just, you know, a black person or a white person, you know, because frankly, you know, I know a lot of us have biases against white people because we think, oh, you know, when I see a white person, you know, my immediate thought is, okay, is how is this person, you know, going to see me? Are they going to be racist? You know, do I have to explain who I am, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, if you come to it with an open mind and open heart, really, and it's, it's that open heart that's really important in say, you know, and, and I'm obviously not everybody has good intentions, right? So I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, you know, if we can at least come from that perspective and, and then, you know, listen and talk to people, but then also find those commonalities. Um, you know, when I look at the parents who are over in East Palo Alto, I have empathy for them because I know they just want their kids to get a good education. Mm -hmm. And I also understand that because I've taken the time to understand my story, my parents' desire, you know, they, they you know, raised us in Spokane, Washington, because they wanted us to have a good education and have to be successful in life. And that's what these parents over in East Palo Alto want. And so I'm going to do whatever I can. Um, to show empathy for them and help their children to to succeed um, and to you know try to find ways to bring housing into our community that allows them to live where you know their kids can have access to all the amenities my kids have you know um, so that's the the I think all of those things are very important mm -hmm. yeah so it's seeing past the stereotypes past the judgments and you see what the real lived uh, internal experience of people are. Uh, you know, when we do these empathy circles, we do them sort of internationally. Mm -hmm. And what comes up a lot is, is the, is the uh, uh, sort of the struggles people have with their families, mm -hmm. right? And you see, wow, everybody in the world is dealing with, you know, their <laughs> problem with their kids or, yeah. you know, their parents, their parents not listening to them. And it's like, wow, everybody sees it. and suddenly you say, wow, it's like, we're all like human. We all have these same problems that we're dealing with. And then, and people comment on that. Wow, this is really see my common humanity. You know, we're all mm -hmm. dealing with these same sort of issues and problems of just our personal relationships. So that's huge. Yeah. And the other thing I want to make sure I mention is um, I'm really interested in this new book by Heather McGee called The Sum of Us, because I think the other problem is we tend to see things in hierarchical terms. You mentioned that earlier. And it's not just hierarchy in terms of, you know, Stanford versus Berkeley or whatever, but it's mm -hmm. also this these 
hierarchies of power. And so we mm -hmm. think, oh my gosh, if those people get power, then I'm losing power somehow. And I think that's one of the biggest mm -hmm. divides we have in this mm -hmm. country right now is that, you know, from a political perspective, we have a group that thinks, and it's not all white people, <laughs> you know, it's, but there's a group that thinks, oh my gosh, you know, these immigrants, these black people, whoever is coming in and they're going to take away my power. And the reality is that's not what happens at all. It's, it's, you know, and Heather McGee's book talks about the fact it's not a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. Basically, the the more we improve the lives of Black people in East Palo Alto or or Berkeley or Oakland or wherever, everybody's you know lifestyle improves. So you know if we improve the schools in in East Palo Alto, that means everybody's life improves because we have better educated kids. They're they're less likely to you know we we end the 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 school to prison pipeline. You know I mean all these things that cost us if we look at it from the right perspective and improve these things, everybody's life will improve. And I think that's a really critical thing for people to understand is it's not a zero sum game. You know, if I get a piece of pie, you can have a piece of pie too. And right. everybody yeah. can have a piece of pie. <laughs> so it's about power. Like what is the relationship of empathy and power? Because a lot of it, it if it becomes a power struggle, then you have that fear, right? It's like, oh, mm -hmm. so I'm going to take, but if there's a, if there's mutual empathy, there i think that the mutual empathy is what sort of addresses that power fear it's like part of the part of power seems to be like i will not be heard right mm -hmm, it's like mm -hmm. power is like who has sort of a voice whose mm -hmm. voice will be heard and if you feel like you're not going to be heard i mean then it's like you get all defensive and and so it's really how do we create a, this mutual uh empathy you know between people to uh to address these problems. It seems to me that one of them is just bringing people together. Can we bring the community in East Palo Alto and Pal you know, the other parts out together into kind of dialogues? It seems that that's a, a mutually empathic dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so that even, you know, the people in you know East Palo Alto have an understanding. Yes, the people in Palo Alto do care and they do want to see change. And, you know, but then it's like, what actions can we take? So, for example, you know, with our we just got a new police chief in Menlo Park. And so, I'm, you know, I'm saying let's, you know, people here in the wealthy part write letters to, to support, you know, that the end of racial profiling, because that will improve situ the situation for people over here. And, you know, and show that you're in solidarity with them. Don't just have the Black Lives Matter sign in your yard, but actually do something about it. Um, write to the community, the um, city council, write to the police chief and tell them that you got your eye on him. And you want to make sure that he's doing right by every citizen, not just the, the wealthier people over here. So. Yeah. So in, in your book, you did say about there's empathy and that the radical part was about taking action. The mm -hmm. thing is, is for me, empathy is one of the most powerful actions there is mm -hmm. yes. that it's like, uh, I mean, a lot of times in society, oh, empathy, you know, you empathize, but that's not action. I mean, when you empathize with someone and they feel that hurt is action. and when it's mutual, I mean, there's physiological stuff that happens. Your, mm -hmm. your, your uh, oxytocin level goes up, your cortisol level goes down, your stress hormones. So there's really, really powerful you know, physiological, constructive, uh, you know, stuff that happens. So I guess yeah. I just want to make the point that I hear it out there that, uh, you know, empathy is, is you know, is, is not oh, necessary. I yeah. But I, I think that if we can bring people together to have mutually empathic, uh, you know, dialogues and relationship, that that's really one of the most powerful things that we can do in our culture and, you know, how and to I, do that. Yeah. I agree with that. Because sometimes I tell people, you know, just that practicing empathy is enough because not everybody is going to want to take action or, you know, get out there and, you know, whatever it may be. So, I mean, I, I do agree with you. I, I do think just that practicing empathy is a really important thing to do. Yeah. And then there's also the second set in terms of action. Sometimes it's like do actions, but action needs to be negotiated empathically too. Because mm -hmm. unless we have the, if you have East Palo Alto, and what's the other part of Palo? Is it it's just Palo Alto? West Palo Alto. Yeah. So it's like, oh, we're we're going to take action. We're going to do something. You know, if, if if Palo Alto is saying that, but if it's not a negotiated dialogue mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what that action is, if it's not mutually sort of agreed upon and negotiated, then it's just like 
you know, it's more like that sympathy. We're just going to sort of throw mm-hmm. this on you is uh, exactly. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100% because when I was talking to some of the city council members in here in Menlo Park, which is also right next door to Palo Alto and, and East Palo Alto, you know, I was saying, you know, whenever we pass a law or a regulation or whatever it is, we should be going through a checklist of how is this going to impact people in East Palo Alto? How's it going to impact people who who work in Menlo Park but live in East Palo Alto? How's it, you know, have a checklist of things because when you're dealing with unconscious bias, if you aren't conscious about it, and you know, I tell people we have to be intentional. You, know, you, you can't just say, okay, you know, I, I, there's unconscious bias. No, you have to say, okay, how am I gonna get around my unconscious bias? So sometimes it's literally having a checklist, um, you know, like with doctors. Um, we know doctors have a bias when they see a, a black person or even a woman come into their, their office. So you have a checklist of things they have to do for every patient. And especially mm-hmm. when it's a patient of color to make sure, you know, that they are going to get treated the same as when a white person steps in. And so sometimes we, we, you know, just to get past that unconscious bias, we have to be very intentional. We have to literally have a checklist of things. So it means that when Palo Alto decides they're going to do something about, um, you know, housing, that they consult with the people who will be impacted. You know, that this that's just, you know, that should be normal anyway, right? When you're doing passing, but we don't think about that a lot of times. We think we know best, and, and we're going to pass this this law or this regulation, and then it happens, and then all of a sudden you're surprised when the people over here don't like it because it impacts them in a negative way or, or they, they weren't included. And, you know, I think that's one of the most important things is that people want to know they're heard and included. Hmm. And, you know, that takes having empathy, right? But it also means, you know, that's why I think your listening skills, um, you know, uh, exercises are so important because it's not just saying, oh, we went and talked to those people. No, were you listening to those people? And I would add another piece to it. It, Barack Obama had a great quote that I just love. He said, it's like we all are responsible for finding common ground. It's the rich, it's the poor, the oppressed and the oppressor. And he goes down the list like that. Mm-hmm. It's not like, hey, it's like Palo Alto has got to be empathic towards East Palo Alto, metaphorically. It's East Palo Alto has to have a culture of empathy within East Palo Alto because there's all kinds of lack of empathy within those communities. And it needs to be mutual. It's like, how do we create exactly. this mutual uh, you know, raising the level of empathy throughout the whole society. Because, I mean, there's, there's all kinds. Of, yeah, <laughs> it starts with each of us. <laughs> but, yeah. but what can we do then? Can we hold? Some, how about we hold some empathy circles? Like I, I had, I've been, you know, my uh, congressman yeah. Mark Desalnier has uh, agreed to take part in an empathy circle well, with yeah. uh, Republicans. So I'm trying to find Republicans now that will take part in an empathy circle with him. There was a, a town hall that he did with Barbara Lee, mm-hmm. uh, you know, before COVID. And they took my question. I was like, last question they had. I said, would, would the representatives, you know, Barbara Lee and Mark DeSalnier, be willing to take part in an empathy circle with Republicans to talk about race? Mm-hmm. And so, and they both agreed to it. So I'm wanting to hold them, you know, uh, you know, to, to their agreement. It's like, is there something we could do to maybe hold some empathy circles, you know, sort of to bridge the divides, bring different communities together to. Absolutely. And I know some folks would be very interested in, and, and, you know, even here on the city council, I think that's a great approach is to have these empathy circles. Um, and because what struck me when I started looking into it, we, we moved to Menlo Park five years ago and, and you know, I, I was the provost at Menlo College for three years, so I hadn't, I didn't have a lot of time to get involved in the community, but now I'm getting more involved. I'm realizing we don't even have a diversity task force in Menlo Park. Palo Alto has one and even Redwood City has one. And I think, you know, these diversity diversity circles would be a really good good place to start even before we created a task like a diversity task force because you have to figure out it's kind of like why I do focus groups before I like do training of people on you know diversity and equity because if you you have to understand your own culture and what are the things that are holding you back as a community and I think that these empathy circles would be a really great way to get people from different parts of, of the city to talk to each other first before we try mm-hmm. to to because right. the, the the tendency and I see this all the time I'm sure you do too, people just want to jump in and do something um and if, tell me what I you know the, the the biggest question I always get when I'm doing this stuff is tell me what I can do and um, it's like, well, start with yourself, start having by having empathy and then start listening, you know, you know, 
be grounded in who you are and then start listening to other people. Because um, if you don't understand where you are coming from as a person and have empathy, then you know it's really going to be really hard when you go and talk to that person in East Palo Alto because you're not you don't understand that. Anyway, you you get it. But yeah, but what it is is there's it's 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 sort of basic to uh, mediation. So right, right. I do mediation. So you've got different groups, but you start with an empathy circle within the groups so that people get familiar with it they start hearing each other and there's even a step before that which i do if, if it's like a family conflict right or is offer listening you do a, what you would call a pre-circle so you listen to one family member for like mm -hmm. an hour just empathically listen to them then you go to the other member in the conflict empathically listen to them so that they have like an hour i mean up to an hour just to feel heard by somebody heard me somebody and that mm -hmm. kind of reduces the stress. They start articulating the, the, the issue more clearly. And then you bring the sides together and then you sort of facilitate an empathy circle. So I think that's sort of what you're addressing. Yes, is that absolutely. people need to get in their own communities and start hearing each other, start sort of articulating where they are right. uh, before even having the really difficult conversations where there's gonna be you know, a lot yeah. of stress and tension that you've sort of set the stage for for those but I'm, I'm curious do you find it seems to me a lot of times you know there's a lot of fear that you can help kind of dispel by doing those you know you know that hour-long discussion because i feel like a lot of times something that really keeps us from having empathy is fear um and you know it's that whether it's you know fear that you know this person is going to hurt you i mean it, it's that's why i talk about you know creating trust because there's that it's so i think it's a combination of fear and lacking trust that that keeps people from being able to kind of take that next step yeah well i think that it's what the trust is built on is will i be heard yeah and it's like people have a sense of inherent fairness you know kind mm -hmm. of a deeper sense if they know I'm well, I'm going to be heard. You know, I'm not going to be put down. I'm going to not going to be negated what I say. I'll be heard to my satisfaction. You know, but I'm willing to listen to you. See, after enough time, people sort of get into that sense of fairness, and it, and that's sort of what builds trust. Is I will be heard too, mm -hmm. and then they just trust in that that I will get my voice heard. So, I think that's sort of a core relationship of empathy and trust is mm -hmm. you know, you've got fear and but the fear is i won't be heard mm -hmm. you know so or i'll yeah. be put down or i'll be criticized or something like that mm -hmm. so i don't know does that kind of resonate or it that, does uh, absolutely because um i think that that's a big issue right and that's why you, that's one of the things you focus on right because and I, I do believe that listening and knowing that you'll be heard is a big part of it. I, and I think that is, that's where that tension with the whole power issue comes in, mm, because mm -hmm. isn't it isn't it power about getting your voice heard and actually somebody taking action on what you want or need? Yeah. You know, so power, influence, all of these things is really about that idea of is are my needs going to be met? And the exactly. way my needs are met is by knowing that I have a voice and that, you know, that person in power is going to hear me and take action on that. Yeah. And, and power can be like this fear of power that the people in power aren't going to listen to me. Right. right. And I got to go demonstrate. I got to just, you know, cause a ruckus so that they finally will listen to me. But if they were already listening, I mean, we'd start getting things done instead of having all this, you know, so I, I, I'm like. I'm so excited about, you know, kind of your work with, you know, empathy and, you know, just because I, I really see that what we're doing here is the core to, you know, constructively moving forward with society. Yes. And I call it building a culture of empathy that we need mm -hmm. to make empathy a primary, primary social value. And we need to have the, you know, the, the, the social structures of, you know, the political structures have to embed empathy even to get the politicians to be empathic with each other, to listen, mm -hmm. to bridge the divide. So, you know, we have this empathy tent. I don't know if you saw any pictures of it, but we have this tent. I said, I started with uh, at Occupy Wall Street here in Berkeley. You mm -hmm. know, it was like the 99 against the 1%. I said, no, we need 100% empathy. So I set up this tent. We offered listening, you know, conflict mediation. And we've set it up over the years 
And now with the Trump, you know, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, we set it up at these demonstrations at Berkeley. We tried to listen to the right wing when they came. We tried to listen to uh, offer listening to Antifa and the demonstrators. And we tried to bring them together to dialogue with, with each other. And I think we need to embed that into the Congress. And I, would, I wanna take this tent to Congress <laughs> and we're gonna set it up on, on Lafayette Park in front of the White House yeah. and in front of Congress. And we're gonna say, we demand that you do empathy circles with each <laughs> other. <laughs> Right. But, you know, I think it would be good to start doing that even with, you know, like um, during an election, you know, if you could get uh, people from both sides. And I've seen this actually in action. There are there's there's I, I can't wish I could remember the name of the organization, but they would get people from both sides to come in. And it wasn't necessarily focused on empathy, but it was focused on listening, which basically is, you know, the underpinnings of empathy. So um, I, I really think that's a great idea in terms of getting because that's, you know, that's bridging. That's what you're doing is bridging the divide. Mm -hmm. If you can bring pe somebody, people who from, come from different backgrounds, but it's also finding areas of commonality. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really interesting to watch our political structures right now. I'm a, you know, I'm a political scientist, so I'm fascinated oh, yeah, with what's right. going on. And, you know, I was in a, another discussion and somebody was asking me, you know, what's a good example of empathy? And I think, I, I, well, Joe Biden is, you know, he's Mr. Empathy. <laughs> you know, he, he, he and, it, and it's funny because when he came in to office, people were like, oh, what is this unity? And we're mad at these other people. And Biden was like, no, we have to, you know, have unity because we, we all want the best for for you know, our children for ourselves you know and um i do think his approach has been really interesting to watch as you know he but he's done what the progressives want by bringing in oh my god you know deb holland you know who just became a, a, a secretary of the interior i mean that's huge <laughs> um to have a, a you know a, a native woman who is in this position and um you know, in all this, you know, having the most diverse cabinet, but yet he's also saying, no, we, we're going to listen to, you know, the people on the other side and, and not even treat them like they're on the other side. They're Americans, for God's sake. You know, we're going to listen to all Americans. And I really like his approach. You know, I, I probably, you know, there's a part of me that's, you know, resentful mm. to what's happened over the last four years. But I also realize, you know, if we're going to get through this and get past this, you know, it really is going to take you know, it's it's all about communication um, and transparency. And even, you know, you, you just have to keep working at people and, and giving them the truth and, and, you know, at least the truth that your truth and, um, you know, work away at uh, these things. And, you know, there's always going to be some divides. I, I don't think we can bridge every divide, but, you know, there's a lot of allies out there. And if they can understand how to, to you know, move in the right direction, I think we can can overcome a lot of this. Well, when Joe Biden had his acceptance speech, uh, I don't know if you saw the banners, there was these huge uh, screens behind there. It said, the people have chosen empathy and truth, mm -hmm. or, or I think it was science and a few other yeah. unity. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, it was core, kind of, you know, put out there. I had sent you a, a link, I don't know if you saw it, it was uh, in terms of the radical empathy, we held a forum, um, mm -hmm. We call it the Radical Empathy Forum, sort of based on, you know, when uh, Hillary Clinton lost the election, she sort of had a, a time where she sort of introspected and she came up with this, you know, talking about radical empathy was, was important. So we set up for our assembly district we have here in, in the East Bay, uh, you know, for Sacramento Assembly District, we set up what we call the Radical Empathy Forum. And we had 11 candidates who were running for office. And they were like mm -hmm. the mayor of El Cerrito and, you know, city council members from Berkeley and uh, uh, Richmond and Oakland. They mm -hmm. came, we had 11 candidates and we actually held empathy circles with them mm -hmm. uh, doing active listening, empathic listening. Uh, so I know it, you know, it, it, can, it, does, it does work if we can bring the politicians uh, together. Mm -hmm. And another thing we've done is like with the political right, uh, I don't know if you remember after Charlottesville, there was a group that came to, uh, it was right after the Patri Patriot Prayer group mm -hmm. they, and others, they came to San Francisco to hold some rallies. Yeah, I remember that. And I mean, yeah, and I reached out to them, actually to Joey Gibson, who was uh, one of the leaders on Patriot Prayer. I said, would you do an empathy circle with, uh, you know, counter protesters? And he said, sure, I'd do it. 
And, you know, I did find get one of the counter protest organizers, and we actually held an empathy circle between the two of them. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, we, it was a shorter one, like half an hour, but it was sort of a start. So I've seen that this can, we can bring these different sides together to have these uh, dialogues. And when you have a sort of a structured dialogue, it really helps with the uh, hearing each other because you you speak until you're heard to your satisfaction or your time mm -hmm. is up so mm -hmm. I, I really see yeah, yeah so i would love to do some you know some if you want to I mean, we can kind of maybe talk offline like you know set something up you know do yeah. them online or you know if you have any well what that... if we get the the city council of east palo alto and the and the, the, and the city council of palo alto to have an empathy circle i okay, think that would do be... it yeah, that'd be a really great way to mm -hmm. start. Uh, and we'll record it and we, we can model it. The thing with recording this too, if we can get some high profile people to do it, you sort of learn by observation, just like mm -hmm. you know, with Jerry Springer, you're learning how to be dysfunctional, you yeah. know, watching those kind of shows. <laughs> but when you watch people really listen to each other and hear each other, you sort of absorb it. And so I, I think that I'm excited about that. So we got a to-do list. <laughs> yes, we do. Absolutely. No, that, that's really great. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this idea of bringing people, you know, like there's so many, it's funny because, you know, you look at our, our, the Bay Area and there's all the, you know, we're divided in all these, you know, little communities. And I, I think it'd be nice to see more you know, kind of breaking down the silos and, and getting people across the communities to talk to each other more, you know, and, and even, yeah, I look at the city of Oakland, you know, that with the gentrification and so on, there's been a lot of conflict. I don't know, have you been involved in any discussions around any of that? Because I think there needs to be, be more um, understanding of what's going on around gentrification and getting people from different communities to talk to each other with the, you know, I think empathy circles is, would be another great way to, to address some of those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, we've been working on the training. Like we, I'm really excited about the training we have. It's now we have, uh, we form a cohort of like 20 people. They mm -hmm. go through this training of how to facilitate an empathy circle. And mm -hmm. you can take the training multiple times so that you become a trainee and then a trainer of it. So that mm -hmm. we can really sort of spread the the uh, practice. So the idea would be is if we could get some of these communities to take part in an mm -hmm. empathy circle, they get the experience of it, they take the training on how to facilitate it, they mm -hmm. become trainers of it, and then they, they can train others in the community as well as facilitate empathy circles. So we can sort of spread the the practice. So. Mm -hmm. That's the current uh, sort of strategy that I've been working on. So that, that's taken a lot of time. So uh, just to kind of set that up, but I think we're really at a really good stage now. So mm -hmm. uh, hope, yeah. So I look forward to uh, you know working on you know, maybe setting some of these up. And so yeah. So okay, and we're almost at an hour. Uh, do you anything else? Uh, any other uh, sort of yeah? This has been a closing? yeah. This has been a really great discussion. I always learn something when I we have these kinds of discussions. So I, I think we should keep the dialogue going. I do follow you on Facebook and so on, and, and um, I've been seeing the work you've been doing. So I hope we can really connect and with any luck, even face-to-face -face sometime in the next year. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done um, at the community level on these issues. And actually, the, you know, the more I talk about it, the more interest I'm seeing. So um, I think uh, that the kind of work you're doing is going to be very welcome over here. Okay, great. So you got the book, uh, Radical Empathy. We're going to be yes. collaborating on this. I'm looking forward to it. Yes. So thank you very much for this uh, engaging uh, conversation, Terry. Yes. So Take see care. See you soon. Bye. Yep.